what? You want to know to what? I'll tell you to what, Thomasina. Little Thomasina, if my mum call, call you that. Why are you people always disturbing me? Sick of the sight of all of you. You, you, because I don't mean that. I'm going to, look, take this stupid hat off, put on this hat. Oh! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, um, my name's Mel Herbert, and I sat the citizen chicken big shit. <laughs> Oopsie. Citizenship exam two days ago, and I passed for my American citizen ship. Not that other word that is different. So, what we have right now, Alma 2 doing another EKG session. This one is about wide complex tachycardias. It's a fascinating case. Is it VTAC? It's always VTAC, right? Always, except when it's not. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of June 10th, 2012. My name's Amal Matu from University of Maryland, and I worked at overnights this past weekend. We had a pretty nice tachycardia case that I thought would be great for one of these cases of the week. It was a 68-year-old woman that presented with tachycardia, and... Actually, she presented with the chief complaint of some foot problem, completely unrelated to her heart or lungs, and she would have probably just gone right back to our fast track, except for the fact that at triage, it was noted that she was running a heart rate of approximately 150. She was completely, completely asymptomatic. So, of course, we got a 12 lady KG to find out what in the world is going on when she got brought up front. And she's got a wide, complex tachycardia. So let's forget about her foot. It is completely unrelated to our main concern. I think maybe she had a little crack between one of her toes and a little athlete's foot or something like that. Whatever. But she's got a tachycardia, which is wide, complex, and regular. So that is something that we in emergency medicine always worry about. And we got to think about what the differential here for this wide, complex, regular tachycardia is. Now, we've gone through this before, and this is the kind of stuff that you'd get on the board exam also, so this is relatively basic. We've talked about this before. The key things you've got to think about, ventricular tachycardia, number one, number two, and number three, especially in a 68-year-old woman who happened to be diabetes. I mean, you've got to think about the worst-case scenario, and ventricular tachycardia is clearly the worst-case scenario here. You can also consider the possibility of an SVT with a bundle branch block pattern. And in this case, this would be a right bundle branch block pattern because she's got an RSR prime in V1. And of course, that's assuming that it's a bundle and not VTAC. And then you can think about sinus tachycardia with the right bundle, atrial flutter with a right bundle branch block pattern. So two big distinctions here. Is this ventricular tachycardia? Or is this just simply some type of supraventricular issue with a right bundle branch block pattern? And the treatments and the inpatient workup are going to be very, very different. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look very, very carefully. She's stable, by the way. If she were unstable, who cares? We'd go right for electricity. But she's pretty stable. She's just laying in the stretcher, chilling, saying, Why are you guys worried about my heart? I'm here for my foot. So... What are we first of all going to do? We're going to look very, very carefully in all 12 leads, plus your two rhythm strips here, V1 and lead 2 down here that you've got. You're going to look everywhere for evidence of P waves. And we've talked before that V1 is probably the best lead for looking for P waves. If you're trying to figure out whether there are P waves, yes or no, Look in V1 first. You want to look everywhere, but look in V1 first. And when you look in V1 in this case, like in other cases we've done in these cases of the week, V1 gives you some answers here. There's little P waves that are kind of halfway between the QRS complexes. So this does actually help a little bit with our differential. With ventricular tachycardia, you can sometimes get P waves, but they don't tend to be regularly associated with the QRS complexes. In other words, those PR intervals tend to be changing. And that's the classic AV dissociation that we've learned to think about with ventricular tachycardia. In this particular case, the PQRS complexes are very clearly regular, and there's kind of a long PR interval. And the problem they give you here is that whenever you've got P waves that are stuck 
somewhere about halfway between the QRS complexes, think about Flutter a little bit more. We'll come back to that thought in just a second. Well, we got some more information beyond just looking at her EKG. We got an old EKG, and this is also very, very important, probably not done often enough. But whenever you're scratching your head about an EKG, take an extra five minutes and get the old EKG. This is from two years ago, and we're very happy to see that she's got an old right bundle branch block pattern. And furthermore, when we put the two EKGs next to each other, the 2010 the old EKG versus what she's got right now, you'll notice that the QRS complexes are completely identical in all 12 leads. Maybe in lead V2, there's a slight difference in the QRS complexes, but in all the rest of the leads, and that might just be from lead placement then, but in all the rest of the leads, the QRS complexes are identical. And what that means to me, when the QRS complexes in the tachycardia EKG are exactly identical to the QRS complexes in the old EKG, what that means to me is that this is the same thing as this. This is a right bundle branch block pattern. This is not ventricular tachycardia. Now be very careful about what I'm saying because you can have an old left or right bundle branch block pattern and then go into new ventricular tachycardia. But when that person goes into the new ventricular tachycardia, some of the QRS complexes are going to change morphology or axis. What you'll notice here is that the 2010 EKG QRS complexes and the 2012 QRS complexes are the same. There's no change in axis, no changes in morphology, same morphology between 2010 and 2012 QRS complexes. And that means if this was a right bundle, then this is a right bundle also. But again, I'm going to say it again. Be very careful. Make sure that all the QRS complexes and all and the axis is unchanged before you ever call something an SVT or some type of supraventricular tachycardia with right bundle based on the old EKG. Hopefully that's clear. So I'm feeling pretty comfortable about saying this is not ventricular tachycardia. This is some type of above the ventricle rhythm with a right bundle branch block pattern going on. So the next question is, is this SVT, is this sinus tachycardia, or is this atrial flutter? Well, we'll take another look at that QRS complex, the tachycardia, and we already talked about the fact that there's little P waves that are kind of halfway between the QRS complexes, and to be honest with you, based on a lot of other EKGs that we've looked at and studied, when the QRS complexes are, when you've got a QRS comp, I'm terrible at drawing, but when you've got QRS complexes with P waves that are halfway between, it's very unlikely that you're looking at an SVT now. In all likelihood, you've now narrowed it down to sinus tach or a flutter. With true SVT, usually there's no P waves. You just have those QRS complexes, or sometimes you'll have a little retrograde P wave, a P wave right after the QRS complex. But in this case, you've got a P wave that's halfway between the QRS complexes, and we looked at V1, you saw that before, and that makes SVT very, very unlikely, all right? So we've now narrowed it down to only two possibilities, sinus tachycardia, or is this atrial flutter? Either way, we're looking at a right bundle branch block pattern. Can a 70-year-old woman have a sinus tachycardia with a rate of about 150? Well, it's pretty close, it's borderline, but she probably can. Generally speaking, how fast can your sinus node beat, right? We've seen neonates that have sinus tachycardia of 200, and a 70-year-old is never going to develop a sinus tachycardia of 200. Generally speaking, what they say is that you take 220 minus your age, and that's how fast your sinus node can beat. So 220 minus 70 is 150, so a 70-year-old woman is capable of mounting a sinus tachycardia of 150. And this patient's EKG shows a rate of about 150, so that has not helped. That's a helpful pearl, by the way. Supposing she came in with a tachycardia of 170 or 180, well, 220 minus 70, there's no way a 70-year-old woman can have a sinus tachycardia of 170 or 180. Certainly extremely unlikely. 
So that's one pearl to keep in mind, which in this particular case is not that helpful. Again, taking a look at V1 and looking at lead 2, looking everywhere, it's really difficult to see any specific flutter waves. Well, here's an idea. How about if we just have the patient do some vagal maneuvers? And if that doesn't work, try some adenosine. Now, what these do is these block the AV node transiently, and the atrium will continue beating normal, but the QRS complexes will slow down transiently. And that's one of the nice things about vagal maneuvers or adenosine, is that even if they don't convert somebody, they can sometimes give you some information which helps you diagnose the rhythm. So that's what we did. We tried some vagal maneuvers, and she wasn't too good at doing them. It didn't do anything. So then we tried some adenosine. She got six or 12, I don't remember, six or 12 milligrams of adenosine, and the atrium continues beating at the same rate, but the ventricle slows down because it blocks the AV node. Fewer impulses get to the ventricle. And shortly after getting the adenosine, you'll notice, we're gonna take a look at our money lead once again at V1, you'll notice what happens. She's beating at an undetermined rhythm and then the ventricle slows down but the atrium still keeps contracting. We'll blow that up for you. The atrium is still beating now. Atrium's going at a rate of about 300 beats per minute, and the ventricle is slowed down. Essentially, by slowing the ventricle down, you get a much better look at what the atrium's doing, and this made it very, very easy. She's got atrial flutter. Now, this is a transient phenomenon. When patients have atrial flutter, you give them some adenosine, it transiently slows the rate down, and it slowed her ventricular rate down for about five or 10 seconds, just long enough for us to clearly diagnose atrial flutter, and then she speeded up and went right back into the tachycardia right here. And so, but we've got our diagnosis now. The adenosine gave us an answer. She's got atrial flutter with two to one AV conduction and the underlying right bundle branch block pattern. So at that point, we're not worried about VTAC, we're not worried about sinus tack. We're not going to just give her IV fluids and try to slow her rate down with IV fluids, right? That would probably put her into failure. We would do that if she were just sinus tachycardia, but she's got atrial flutter. She needs an AV nodal blocker. So what we did was we just gave her a couple of doses of metoprolol because she was already on that at home. And after about 10 or 15 milligrams of metoprolol, she ended up converting to sinus rhythm. This is actually sinus tachycardia. She's got a little bit of a first degree AV block, but she converted back to her sinus rhythm with a right bundle branch block pattern. So very, very nice, uh, relatively simple, but I think a common case, we oftentimes get these supraventricular versus ventricular tachycardia quandaries, and this is a, a nice example of how to work through this particular type of case. Uh, again, that adenosine can sometimes be very helpful by slowing the ventricular rate down and looking for the flutter to suddenly uh, become very obvious. So I hope that case was helpful to you, and I look forward to talking to you again next week. Bye for now.